Welcome, or welcome back to our role-based webinar series, which we began in the fall of 2021. Today, we will focus on the role of teachers in school safety efforts, which includes school safety, security, emergency management, as well as preparedness activities. As with all of our webinars in this series and beyond, there are a few tips for engaging with the platform and with us throughout the event today. We have placed links relevant to today's topic in the web links pod. Please feel free to explore those web pages and to share them with your colleagues. We also welcome you to pose any questions using the Q&A pod or use that to communicate any technical difficulties that you may experience during today's event. We will host a Q&A session towards the end of today's webinar and we will answer as many questions as possible at that time. We will also be hosting a 30-minute web chat via the RMCA Center's Community of Practice the end of the event to answer any additional questions that we were not able to get to. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available in archived form on our site within a week. And if you have any questions, do not hesitate to send them to our help desk at info at remcacenter.org. I am so happy to introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Jill Barnes is the Administrator of Emergency Management for the Los Angeles Unified School District, leading emergency readiness and response for the 1,000 plus schools within LAUSD. She and her team advise schools on emergency procedures, create guidance documents and resources, oversee emergency related training, manage the Emergency Operations Center, and collaborate with government and community agencies during emergencies. Dr. Burns' diverse education and first responder experience includes work as a teacher, coordinator, administrator, police officer, and fire department public information officer. She is also a certified emergency manager, and we are so grateful to have her join this conversation today. Let's take a look at the agenda for today's webinar. First, we'll provide an overview of the importance of collabor collaborative planning in School Emergency Operations Plan, also known as EOP development. Then I'll turn things to Dr. Barnes, where we'll have her explore a bit more the specific role of teachers in school safety. The RMCA Center will also discuss how teachers can help enhance the six-step planning process that is used to support the development of a high-quality EOP. And as mentioned, we'll also have a Q&A session where we'll take some time to answer any questions that you may have about this topic. And as always, we'll end with some key resources to support your work. And as I mentioned before, we will be hosting a 30-minute web chat on our community of practice immediately following this event. You can access that link towards the end of the event. We will send that as well um, for your direct access. Before we dive into the presentation, we do want to learn a little bit more about you and whether you've heard of the RMCA Center before today's session. And if so, in what context? Perhaps you've attended a live training or a virtual training, requested technical assistance or downloaded a resource, met us at a national conference or in some other way where we'd always um, love to hear whether we have new friends or existing friends joining us for events. And looking at the responses coming in right now, it looks like we do have um, some familiar faces, if you will. Some of you have, um, a good majority of you have attended a virtual training or downloaded a resource. Some have also attended a live training or requested TA or met us at a national conference. I see that some of you are specifying where you've met us, and we're always great to uh, know that you are finding the resources that we find helpful and supportive. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. If this is your first time meeting the RMCA Center, welcome. The U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Supportive Schools 
administers the REMCA Center to help build the preparedness capacity, including prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery efforts of schools, school districts, and institutions of higher education with their community partners at the local, state, regional, and federal levels. Our staff members are available via phone or email to respond to your request for technical assistance. So if you are a new um, friend of ours and need support, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are always happy to provide support where we can. Let's dive into the discussion now. As we know, families and communities expect schools and school districts to keep children and youth safe from threats, including crime and violence, unfortunately, as well as hazards like natural disasters, disease outbreaks, and hazardous material spills. In collaboration with their community partners, schools and school districts can plan for these potential threats and hazards through the creation of an emergency operations plan. The school EOP describes how people, not just students, but also teachers, administrators, staff, facilities managers, and visitors, as well as property, will be protected. It also details who is responsible for carrying out specific actions before, during, and after emergencies. An EOP also helps identify the personnel, equipment, facilities, supplies, and other resources that are available and also outlines how actions will be coordinated in collaboration with partners. While school EOPs vary in their content as they are customized according to that school building level, they generally contain three main sections. The basic plan section provides that overview of the school's approach to emergency operations, such as training, exercises, and information collection. The functional annexes section presents how the school will manage common essential functions like evacuation, communication, accounting for all people, et cetera, before, during, and after an emergency. And the threat and hazard specific annexes section identifies protocols that schools will follow to address specific emergency types, such as active shooter incidents, hurricanes, wildfires, tornadoes, food contamination, and power outages. It is recommended that school EOPs be developed by school-level emergency planning and response teams with membership from the district's core planning team. The formation of this multidisciplinary planning team is really step one of the six planning process that is outlined in the Guide for Developing High-Quality School Emergency Operations Plans, also known as the School Guide. That process is also outlined in the role of districts in developing high-quality school EOPs, which we refer to as the district guide. And these guides may be used by core planning teams to create new plans, as well as to revise and update existing plans and align their emergency planning practices with those at the national, state, regional, and local levels. You may access at-a-glance versions of these guides via the web link, pause, or download the PDF via the RevCA Center's website. And why collaborate? Because planning and the development of a school EOP truly requires the expertise of a diverse group of people so that it reflects the diverse needs of the school community. Everyone has expertise to contribute, including administrators, school nurses, families and parents, IT specialists, school psychologists, transportation directors, and I could go on. And of course, teachers are included in that list, which is why we are here today. Teachers have a wealth of knowledge about students and other teachers' perceptions, the perspectives of families and caregivers, insights from members of the whole school community, and much more. But how does that knowledge relate to and impact a school EOP? That knowledge can be used to develop annexes for functions, threats and hazards that you see on your screen, as well as to support other activities that play a part or that impact emergency management planning. As you can see, and as you will learn today, teachers really do have critical insight on the variety of areas within safety, security, emergency management, and preparedness, and therefore should 
serve as members of core planning team. They can provide support in thinking through those functions, including family reunification, accounting for all persons, shelter in place, lockdown, continuity of operations, just to name a few. Also, when thinking about specific threats and hazards, as well as other activities, such as culture and climate assessments, youth preparedness, and capacity assessment. So knowing that teachers play such a critical role in collaboration with other partners, we would like to take some time now to just check with you to get some feedback via a poll on the role that you play within school safety, security, emergency management, and preparedness in your locality or state. You might support developing EOPs, serving on an ad hoc team, providing training or TA, and it looks like we are getting responses in. And we're so happy to see that more than 50% of you are supporting the development of emergency operations plans. And we hope that you find the information that we share today helpful as you continually um, develop and enhance your plans. Yeah, I also see that um, more than half of you are providing training and technical assistance, as well as supporting response and recovery. Some are, uh, you are noting that you serve as safety or security consultants. Some are uh, serving as teachers, as well as chairs of the crisis or safety committee. And we know that in many schools and school districts, teachers play multiple roles. So we're so happy to have you all join us and we really appreciate you sharing. Please continue to share via um, the Q&A box additional roles that you serve. I see we also have school resource officers, school nurses. We thank you all for sharing. And please don't forget that the RevCA Center has hosted other webinars that look at additional roles um, as well within, at that school level. But thank you so much for participating in that poll. So with that foundation of the importance of collaborative planning and having that understanding of the important role that teachers can play, I am now going to turn things over to Dr. Barnes, who will delve more into that specific role of teachers. Dr. Barnes? Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. I am. I am resisting the urge to say good morning because I'm out here in Los Angeles where it's just after 9 a.m., but I know that we are scattered across the country and have a variety of time zones represented. Um, so thank you for having me on this webinar. And we're going to start by looking at what we can do before emergencies. So there's a couple of different phases of emergencies before, during, and after. And those kind of neatly dovetail into the, uh, the five mission areas. And so we'll start with prevention, which is one of the before areas. And I've provided a little definition up there for you on the slide. And one of the aspects of prevention, when it's talking about preventing a threatened or actual incident, while that can definitely include natural disasters and other sorts of hazards, it does also have a, an emphasis um, on some of the physical security pieces. So for that, school culture and climate really does play a key role. It makes a big difference. And when schools are both explicit and implicit about ensuring that teachers um, are aware of the school culture and climate pieces that impact them and the ways that a school is addressing school culture and school climate, it really helps to move things along. Um, one thing that we do know about schools, especially when you look at uh, some sorts of like uh, security threats, is that when students feel connected to a school, they tend to speak up, they have a trusted adult on campus, and that really helps keep some instances from occurring. Uh, one of the things on here is uh, so ensuring that every student has an adult that they can talk to on campus is one good way to make sure that students have somebody that they can go to when they do have some sort of a concern. And um, making sure that both staff and students, so that all the teachers as well as the students know 
how to report a behavior of concern, whether it's just, hey, my, my best friend is, is acting funny, or I found this in the hallway. And again, whether it's coming from a student or a staff member, because sometimes we find that the, the staff members aren't clear on what to do with those sorts of, that sort of knowledge either. And those concerning behaviors, that could be drawings, they could be images, writings, social media posts, that's of course a huge one recently. Any sorts of things like that, if we have a clear way for everyone to make sure that um, someone else is getting a heads up on those things, it's very, very helpful. One of the other things that is really important that teachers can do is just kind of be, uh, be mindful of situational awareness. And situational awareness is really just being aware of their surroundings, being the eyes and ears in the field when you're standing at your classroom door and you're watching the kids go by in the hallway, on your way into the classroom from the parking lot. Um, since I did have a police and fire background after I returned to teaching, because I taught and then went away and did the fire and police thing and then came back to education. When I came back, I would hot lap the school. I would drive around the entire perimeter of the school just to see what was up before I even went into the teacher parking lot. I don't expect everybody to do that, by the way. But just having that, those, your eyes and ears um, available. In uh, police departments, sometimes they talk about, talk about it as keeping your head on a swivel. Just kind of being mindful, but in a way that, that is just a part of the component. I, I think that teachers already know how to do situational awareness. Because think about it, teachers always know when a kid is cheating in the room. It's just expanding that kind of awareness to other sorts of things that they may not be used to paying attention to. So they already do have a level of situational awareness. It's just kind of expanding it to other sorts of elements. And then also another impact is knowing what is out of place. Uh, one of the things that comes up when you're looking at um, uh, things that might be misplaced on a campus or they're, you know, a suspicious package sort of thing. It's kind of funny because in the non-education world, the, the usual standard thing is there's a backpack. Well, <laughs> that's not going to stand out or be unusual or out of place on a school. But if people are aware of what might be out of place, and again, how to report it, who they should tell, what they should do about it um, is also good. Next slide, please. So another aspect is the protection aspect, and this is what we do at the school site um, to be ready for emergencies. And that includes plans, all of our emergency plans, like the EOPs that, that it seems like we all create looking at the poll, and as well as emergency drills. Um, so I know there's a, a lot of information on this screen, but uh, bear with me and I'll, I'll get through that. So one aspect is once you do have your EOP, making sure that it is available to everybody. I put ours in an online format so that people could access it digitally and it's available to every person that works at that school as opposed to just the people who were creating it, having hard copies available, especially for people that don't necessarily have digital access. And then you do have to train people on the plan. You've got to train often, you've got to train well, and you have to be consistent. People are going to do as, as they are trained to do if you train them frequently enough that it becomes ingrained in them. Um, then they will, in, in the middle of an emergency, they're just going to go with what they know. One thing that will help doing that is making sure that your pr procedures are written out clearly and available for everybody. And video training can be really helpful as well. And one thing um, I'll talk about a little bit later, but I have a lot of online training. And one thing that's helpful about it is in the online training, I know that everybody's getting the material in the same way. There's not a lot of editorializing, which sometimes can be very helpful uh, to, especially in a large district like mine. So making sure that all of your staff are ready, that they know the procedures, that they know their emergency roles, that they're part of an emergency team, um, anything that you can front load people with and front load the teachers with ahead of time is just gonna reduce those anxieties that they may have about emergencies. If people know what to expect, uh, then it's, it's just going to be a lot smoother of a day. One thing that you can do, too, is to survey your staff about what emergency teams they may well be suited for. We all have lives outside of our educational realm, and sometimes some of those experiences, whether they are concurrent with a teaching career 
or happened previous to it may be very beneficial to the school and may and, and may well come in come in handy. I know we have a fair number of teachers out here that sometimes in the summer are lifeguards and all of our lifeguards on the ocean are also EMTs or emergency medical technicians. Do I want them on their school first aid teams? Yes, I do. Things like that. Some people may be scout masters, and especially if you're in a larger school or if you've got a few new people, uh, you may not be aware of the backgrounds and other experiences that some people have had. So giving them a quick little survey about what they've done and ways that they think they might be able to contribute is a good way to do that. One thing that I do want to make sure that I stress is the the way that teachers have, are in a great and somewhat unique position to advocate for their students, especially for their students with disabilities and other needs. Uh, these teachers are with these kids all day long. They know the kids. They know their needs. And sometimes our emergency plans and our materials are really kind of a, a one-size-fits-all sort of thing, and that doesn't tend to work very well for kids that do have different needs. So those teachers are in a great position to speak up and advocate for what their specific kids need. Things like um, a teacher was once describing a drill to me that she had participated in where they were doing kind of a reunification drill and they loaded the kids on the bus and they gave them all bottled water. But she had some kids that uh, she was supervising that had some significant disabilities and couldn't drink out of a bottle of bottled water. They used sippy cups at school. Well, you know, if the school is aware of that, they can actually stock a few sippy cups in their emergency supplies, whether it's in the classroom, if it's classroom supplies, or if there's a cache of emergency supplies on the campus. Uh, things like making sure that uh, some classes of students with needs, if they're located on the first floor where they don't have to travel as far or travel down stairwells, and not only just for the kids with physical disabilities, but a, a DHA, Stefan Hard of Hearing Teacher, pointed out to me that it was important to locate the classroom of deaf students on the first floor as well, so that the teacher, who has to be visible to the students to speak, as opposed to other people when we're evacuating kids, you can you know, say something to them and have your back turned to them or from the back of the line. But if you're working with a DHH population, you need to turn around and face those students. Well, then you don't want to go tripping down the stairwell because you've turned around to uh, communicate with your students. So little things like that that the teachers already know. If there's a way for them to provide that information and contribute to their emergency plans, it will be really great. One thing that I think that we can do as well is uh, really kind of recast emergency readiness as an equity issue and as a social justice issue, which I think it definitely is in some of our neighborhoods and in our schools. How can we level out those things if we have districts or schools where parents um, are very generous and can provide a lot of additional emergency supplies, how do we lean forward to provide that in schools and neighborhoods where that may not be the case? I know that in LA Unified, we don't require parents to provide any of the emergency materials because we have so many parents that would not be able to provide. So uh, the district provides, if, if there's something that, that the schools need, the district or the school provides it to them. We don't have the parents contribute you know, a meal or a snack or anything for their students to keep for emergencies, just to even out those inequity issues. And then just making sure that things that you're doing in terms of the emergency procedures, not only are focused on what the teachers and the classroom brings to it, but also focused on the students. It's great when we are directive to and with the teachers about the expectations that we have in place for an emergency, but even better when we can kind of recast that to be focused on what the student needs to do. And for secondary students, of course, they can be really addressed and um, directly even. And then just looking for those teachable moments. I'll talk about that a little bit more later, um, where we have little opportunities throughout the day, especially in the classroom, to kind of build in some of those other opportunities. Next slide, please. So mitigation, I always tend to think of mitigation as really what we do to strengthen our buildings and systems uh, that we have in place, because it really is about um, how can we make the bad thing not happen, or what can we do to really reduce the loss of life or injuries. 
So uh, there's a couple of components of that. There's both structural components, warning systems, then there's non-structural conditions as well. And one thing that um, I, I think that we need to focus on are the warning systems, the fire alarms, and of course the best way to test those fire alarms is during those fire drills, so making sure that those are happening as they should be scheduled, if not more frequently, and that any issues with those are addressed. And something new that many of you may not be aware of is the Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning System, which we are just kind of on the ground floor of out here on the West Coast. And there is a way in which you can actually get an alert that an earthquake is imminent and going to occur before you can feel the shaking. It'll only give us maybe 10 seconds worth of warning, but that's enough time to get everybody to drop cover and hold on. So the more we can do uh, to make our, our systems more robust, the more we can integrate into other systems. If there's any sort of technological upgrade that's being made to your school, what else can you ask about? You know, what other options are there? What other ways can we um, leverage some of the security and technological features that might be present in some of our systems just to kind of make, us, make our buildings even more resilient? One of the things that comes up with the non-structural hazards are the classroom conditions. And it's not just necessarily the pack rat conditions, but things like not putting things in front of an emergency exit. Uh, so one of the handouts, I'm not sure if I have it with me today, one of the handouts that we have is a classroom hazard hunt. And it really just has like a diagram of a classroom with all the things that somebody shouldn't be doing with a little guide to it on the back that explains what the issue is with it and how to correct that and what they should be doing instead. Um, and of course, it's always useful when you are having those conversations with colleagues, if you do have to address something, uh, some sort of a mitigation sort of issue in, in a classroom, to make sure that they know the reason why, not just you can't have that here, but, but why. Um, people tend to respond much better if they know the reason. And then making sure that with the fire alarms, that all of the alarms are actually paid attention to. I know out here sometimes we have issues with fire alarms where they go off unscheduled, whether they're set off by students or whether there's a construction issue or something. But we do need to make sure that we are conditioning ourselves and each other and our students to react when we do hear those alarms and those notifications and to evacuate like we're supposed to. Um, because otherwise, what are we really teaching the kids? If we're teaching them to ignore the fire alarm, um, at, at some point that will become a danger. If not at school, it could be a danger for them at home if they just think that they can ignore them. Next slide, please. So there are some other things that we can do uh, to kind of address some of those things and make some of the emergencies either not occur or make them less bad. One thing that we can do is there are a lot of opportunities to embed emergency readiness directly into the curriculum. Um, there are there are ways there I, I can think of science lessons and English lessons and math lessons and history lessons. Any of those could be applicable to the disaster world in many ways. Uh, there are a lot of little ways that you can embed uh, disaster awareness and readiness into uh, everybody's curriculum, writing prompts, family engagement, if you've got at times when families are coming in, how they can support one another and activities that they could do that will help with that. And then if there's any sort of group learning or problem solving, a lot of the disaster readiness information is really ideal for those sorts of little learning opportunities. Um, I actually, I, I, I was an English teacher by trade, and I've got a couple of degrees in English, so I am probably the only emergency manager that has a fiction literature page on my emergency management website. <laughs> so if you would like to check that out, I've, I've got just, and it's just my personal reading recommendations. I have no idea if anybody's ever even looked at it. It's really there for me. I will say, however, that if you are looking for disaster-related fiction, I highly recommend Station Eleven. Cannot recommend that enough. And I've done things like we will do something for all of our schools in the tsunami zone every year on Tsunami Week. And one year, I found age-appropriate literature for each of our schools and sent that out on Tsunami. And that was things like The Big Wave. There was a, a preschool book, a really nice picture book that had to do with waves. Um, and I was able to find middle school, elementary school, high school, and adult-related tsunami fiction just to, for something different to send out to them. 
to the school. Then we do have a lot of the emergency preparedness curriculums that are out there. Um, I just put down some of the things that I'm aware of. Rocket Rules is fairly new. It's been around for a couple of years. It's a cute little program that has several different modules for the younger elementary kids. Masters of Disaster, I think, is for fourth grade. Here in California, Cal OES, which is our state emergency management agency, has the preparedness ambassadors. Then there are things like Team Cert, which is really wonderful on a high school campus. Hands-only CPR, Stop the Bleed training. And I cannot also recommend the Extreme Event game highly enough. That is an amazing one-hour experience where you are playing in a role. You're moving around. You're talking to people. It works fantastic for staff. I played it with, uh, with school personnel. It works also really well for high school, middle school, and probably upper elementary kids as well. The materials are free. So if you Google Extreme Event, you'll be able to find the materials on that game. And um, in an hour, people really kind of, I would say, capital get, capital it. They understand some of the complexities in navigating a large emergency. So I really recommend that as well. Next, next slide, please. So then we really kind of move into the response phase, um, which is during the emergency. And there are a couple of things that, that we can do here. And I've kind of broken this into two slides, one that's focused on what we can do with staff or teachers and what we can do with students directly. So um, people really want to continue operating within what they know their role to be during an emergency. People cling to those roles. So if we have done a really good job at our school sites of training our personnel to uh, to, to know what they are expected to do in an emergency, whether they have a different role on an emergency team than they do during the regular school day, or whether it's just to evacuate or lockdown procedures. If we train them, that just becomes part of their everyday role, and then they will still be able to um, continue to act within that role. It's really helpful. Um, there's actually some research that's been done on, on how harmful it can be when people cling to a role that is no longer suited during a disaster. We can also, one thing that I would really encourage people to do is to make sure that you're really getting broad participation on your emergency teams across your entire staff. And sometimes that can come out of uh, some of those emergency surveys. You may find some surprises among some of your staff members. And many of the teachers do have some wonderful skill sets that can come in handy. Because one of our big uh, threats and hazards out here is earthquakes. We have a pretty robust emergency management um, response plan that includes all of the different types of emergency response teams, and a lot of those roles are filled by teachers. So we actually have it in our plan that when we evacuate and we go out to the field, most of the teachers then leave their students with another, with another, with a colleague or a few colleagues that are watching the entire area where the students are gathered and then they go off to perform their alternate emergency roles. And it works really well. Um, we have to get past the expectation that, you know, uh, you're going to go out with your field, with your, your class, you're going to evacuate to the field, and then you're just going to stay there with them. Um, it's perfectly acceptable and works really well to have a few people who are identified to watch all of the kids to leverage more of your employees in different ways for emergencies. I think it's also really important to make sure that we are focusing on our emergency teams by their team name to kind of build that awareness and, uh, and build it appropriately. For example, the people that are watching the kids out in that area, if we call them the assembly area team and not like, okay, Team Tiger, it helps build that culture of what we're doing during an emergency and who's involved. And it also really helps to give each team a, vi a visual cue. Vests, emergency vests work super well. One of the things that I did during COVID was I designed and, and, and ran hands-on every day a uh, vaccination super site out at one of our professional sports stadiums. It was a massive, massive outdoor site. So it was an empty parking lot when we started. And um, everybody on site had to wear a vest. And I had our medical staff wear one color of vest and support staff wear another. And then the command staff who were running the uh, the operation were wearing a third color of vest, and especially because it was such a large area and spread across such a great distance and we could barely see each other's faces, having those colored vests 
was enormously helpful in our daily operations. And the same thing happens in emergencies as well, just even across your campus. So colored hard hats, if you have teams that are going in and doing hard hat work, you can get those color coded. They make them in a bunch of colors, including gold, because we have a golden hard hat award sometimes that we give out to certain people in our district. Uh, they have a wide variety of those, as well as uh, the, the vests. And if you have both of them, even better for that visual cue. And that way we know who's on which team and where they are and what they're doing. Next slide, please. So there are some student-focused things that we can do. And one thing that I think that we can always do is remind one another and remind teachers that, you know, students look to the teacher to find out what to do. They get a lot of their cues from the teachers and, and from the professionals in, the, in their classrooms anyway. We need to build that expectation during emergencies. And of course, if the teachers know what they're expected to do, then they'll be able to better respond to that. But the students will definitely be watching and taking their cues from the teacher. So we want to make sure that people are prepared to model the behavior that we want to see. If we're doing a drop, cover, hold on drill, for example, like we do for earthquakes, we definitely want the teachers to drop, cover, and hold on as well so that the teachers can see that model, or the, the students can see that modeled for them. Uh, I think it always really works well when we are explaining what we do and why we're doing it. Um, students are no different than our adults in our lives, and they like to hear the why. And when we give people the why of what we're doing, it actually helps that information stick better in, in people's minds. And I think it actually also helps them get to higher level thinking skills. We want the students as well as the teachers to be able to apply what they're learning for drills into other aspects of their lives. Um, we've had a couple of occasions where, you know, a, a teacher who, is, who has uh, children of her own if there's a small earthquake or something at home, and they'll say, oh, honey, I, I noticed you didn't drop cover and hold on. I'm like, oh, yeah, mommy, that's what we do at school. Well, we need to be working on those higher level thinking skills so they can apply things across into different areas. I think we can also do a little bit to involve students appropriately during the response phase as well. And I'm talking little things. One thing that we do is um, my team and I provide evac chairs that go down the stairs for the students with physical disabilities who can't negotiate the stairs themselves. And one thing that we do for that is we don't train. When I'm doing the initial training, we don't do that training with the student because if, as we're learning, we want to be proficient before we show that to the students. But we do also show the student the chair, show them where it's kept so that they can help advocate for their own needs, which I think is important for some of our kids with disabilities. And also we give them something to do. So if it's a clipboard or something that somebody has an emergency, giving that clipboard to the student and saying, please hold this, please hold this clipboard with the emergency information for me. Hold it very carefully with both hands. Um, thank you very much. They feel like they're a part of, of the response and then the disaster isn't happening to them, it's happening with them, and they have some agency in their lives, even in, in the disasters. Uh, we just want to be careful that we're not leveraging students inappropriately. Um, we don't send in, you know, football players. Some of them are very strong at the high schools. We don't send them in to rescue people who may be trapped, or even though they are very strong, because they are students. and. You know, our role as educators in the schools is to take care of the students in our care. So we don't want to use other students um, to do that instead of using our staff. So do be mindful as you think about how to engage students, how to engage them appropriately. Using them as runners during emergency works really well as long as they're in a safe area, providing messaging across there, especially because communications are often down. Next slide, please. And then, of course, after the emergency, then we get to recovery. And recovery is such a huge thing that for a lot of emergency managers, it has its own completely separate structure and a completely separate batch of people at the school site and within the school realm. I think it's a little more tightly connected. But there are several things that we need to, to keep in mind when there's a big disaster. I know in our locale, the very first question that I ever get is, when are schools reopening? And there's several reasons for that. For one thing, it is a sign that the community is returning to normalcy if the schools are able to reopen. Um, also, there are a lot of parents that can't return to work until their children can return to school. 
And it is also a really great way to embed some of those community resources, especially because we do have schools in all of our neighborhoods. Um, we've got them everywhere. People are already used to going there. The families are already used to getting their educational services there. If there's a way to connect with the community agencies and embed those resources within the school, then that's really helpful. Teachers can be really key there as well because they see and hear things throughout the day and they may be aware of experiences of students before anybody else's or nobody else may be aware and a teacher may find out that a student has been impacted whether it's a social emotional impact of a disaster or um, something that has impacted their living situation or the family's livelihood, they can really be well poised to get those students hooked up with some of the resources that can help them. There's a couple of different aspects of recovery. We look at instructional recovery, so having that continuity of instruction plan, not just the continuity of operations plan, but you know, what do you do when, if, 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 if this school isn't up and running, are you using another one? Are you going virtual, hybrid? Um, encouraging teachers to have lesson plans available specifically to use emergency lesson plans can be really helpful. Looking for different types of materials that might be more accessible than something that might be textbook based or something is also really helpful. They can easily contribute to that continuity of instruction plan. It's an excellent role for teachers to help. There's also the physical uh, <clears throat> recovery, which has to do with rebuilding buildings, repairing damages. There is business and support roles for recovery, which would be things like transportation, food services. Uh, the socio-emotional is another area where students can really be, or not students, where teachers can really be very, very helpful if they're trained in psychological first aid, PFA, if they know how to listen, protect, connect with the students. Um, and again, they're gonna, they're gonna see some behaviors. So if they are mindful of where those behaviors may be coming from and why, then it will really help to get those students and their families hooked up to the resources they need much faster. And then looking for things that might actually um, trigger some students. Uh, I know that in one of the wildfires that they had in Northern California, when the school buildings were ready to reopen, the path that the school bus took went right through all of that fire. So the staff at first was wondering why when the kids were getting to school in the morning, they seemed traumatized all over again. And it was from riding through the devastated neighborhoods on their way to school. So being mindful of that, and again, teachers may be in the, the, a point where they can pick up on some of those cues a little earlier than everybody else. Next slide, please. I think we're back to Janelle. Thank you so much, Jill. There were so many great strategies, recommendations, and lessons learned that you shared. We really appreciate that. Let's spend a little time now walking through how teachers can enhance that six-step planning process that we talked about at the start of the webinar. As mentioned earlier, the most comprehensive and effective school EOP is developed by a multidisciplinary planning team which adds to the value and the breadth, depth, scope and of the plan. Ensure that you have a teacher as a member of your core planning team, as well as other ad hoc teams, as Jill described. The teacher is not only a steward from other teachers, but also carries the safety and training messages from the core planning team back to their colleagues, and most importantly, to students. In step two, the planning team identifies hazards and threats unique to the school community and then prioritizes them. Assessments are important sources of information such as site assessments and capacity assessments. Invite teachers to lead or be a member on the school culture and climate assessment team, which will provide that information on perceptions of school safety from students, staff, and other members of the school community. Teachers may be able to provide insight on the types of questions that may be posed as a part of those assessments based on their, their knowledge that they've gained from those classroom experiences. Also involve teachers in capacity assessment creation and analysis. Capacity assessments capture resources available and staff capabilities and may reveal skills of teachers in other areas, just as Jill described outside of teaching. In thinking about step three, during which the team decides which threats and hazards will be addressed in the EOP and then develop goals and objectives for each, 
Ensure that a teacher or a group of teachers participates in the development of those goals and objectives, thinking about one function in particular, uh, family reunification. Possible goals, which are both broad and general um, for the function, could include looking at before an emergency, having the capacity to relo relocate students to that safe location. During an emergency, working with families and caregivers to communicate and safely reunify students. And then, of course, after an emergency, supporting the school with restoring that safe and healthy learning environment. And teachers can also provide insight on other types of functions, including recovery, shelter in place, accounting for all persons, and, and so much more. In step four, the planning team builds upon those goals and objectives created in the previous step and assigns courses of action that address the who, what, and how for actually achieving those goals. Together, they form annexes, or portions of the EOP. Invite teachers to participate in scenario-based planning to imagine the different ways that an emergency may unfold and those necessary courses of action that will need to be taken. Teachers may interject with their roles and responsibilities such as helping to account for all students, locking classroom doors and windows, gathering the classroom go kit, and ensuring, as Jill described, that it includes all of those pertinent supplies for all students, including those with access and functional needs, as well as directing students to and leading them from evacuation routes or reunification sites. So there are a variety of ways that teachers can support schools with thinking through those courses of action. And step five, the team develops a basic plan of the school EOP, formats those annexes, and then reviews all sections in collaboration with partners. After the plan is approved by leadership, the plan should then be securely shared with community partners, keeping in mind only portions of that plan might be shared based on the roles and responsibilities outlined. And teachers can play a critical role in communicating portions of the plan to students and or update the portions of the plan based on lessons learned, um, emergencies that take place, and or um, new protocols based on state or local legislation. Finally, the planning team needs to implement the EOP. This means providing the whole school community with training and opportunities to actually practice the plan. As Bill said, you know, train well and often and consistently. So practicing that plan is so important. Consider inviting teachers to attend and lead trainings and to participate in and observe exercises. As members of the core planning team, they will be able to contribute to the revision and maintenance of the EOP after an event, whether a real emergency or an exercise. And this is really how planning teams can close the loop and ensure that the plan continually evolves to meet the needs of the whole school community. Well, thank you. We do know that we've received some questions already. We are happy now to enter our question and answer section. We will um, answer as many questions as possible um, based on what we have seen submitted so far. I think what we can start with just looking at the, week, the questions that we've received, if you don't mind, Dr. Barnes, is what do teachers really need to know? Um, many components of the operation, thinking about emergency operations plans specifically, are administrative in nature and may be overwhelming for a teacher. So what would you recommend as um, some of those key things that teachers really need to know? Dr. Barnes? Sure, I think that I would focus on giving them the information that they immediately need, and that is what do they need to do in their classroom to address situations when there's an emergency during that response. And those would be our basic things of making sure that everybody's aware of the procedures for lockdown, a shelter in place for environmental hazards, how to safely evacuate the building and where to go, and, well, for us on uh, drop, cover, and hold on for earthquakes for us, although that might not apply nationwide. Um, but focusing on those, those, I would start with those. What do you need in the classroom during the emergencies? And then I would bet that a lot of the teachers are going to have questions based on that, and then you can lead that into some of the preparedness efforts. 
Thank you so much, Jill. I think another important question that we see here, uh, Dr. Barnes, is how do schools find time to do this work with teachers while attending to other training needs for teaching and learning? It's a lot. I mean, there's there's a, a lot that gets packed into the day and the week and the year. And as we all know, nothing ever seems to get taken out of that year. Things just seem to get added to it. And some of our emergency responses get more um, complex as they go along as well. And we need to add to those too over time. So it is difficult finding the time. One thing that I do is that I have a whole lot of my trainings online, which works really well for me since I've got a thousand schools and for eight years I was an office of one. So, you know, I definitely was not going out individually to a thousand schools to train them on how to do things. But having the, the trainings in this short format, the ones that I have, they're all like 20 minute videos. That seems to be about the amount of time that people can find time to watch. And if they're available through like a learning management system so that uh, employees can take them whenever they have the time, as opposed to everybody having to stop what they're doing at a certain point in time, it can um, allow us a little bit more flexibility. And then of course, you're still getting that consistency because the training is the same over time. And you can build in you know, checks for knowledge and pre, pre and post assessments and things like that into those online learnings as well. And then making sure that you've got a good website with resources, again, because you know if I am out in the field, then I'm, I'm not necessarily near the resources. So I try to make sure that I've got as much information available for people to download and, and uh, information that they can get for themselves so that if they can't get to me, they can still get to the information that they need. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnes, for answering that question. We have another question that I think is very critical. It's how to support teachers and their needs to support children as we all navigate the mental and emotional toll of all that's happening around us. And I can answer that. And we certainly understand and appreciate all the work that teachers and other practitioners within the school building do to support school safety and emergency preparedness. And in thinking about that mental and emotional toll, the REMCA Center um, recommends that education agencies think through resilient strategies that can be used specifically for educators. And if you take a look at the web link pod, you will see two resources that uh, specifically relate to that. Number five, which is a training that we offer that specifically looks at resilient strategies for educators and um, some of the concepts that we that come up when we think about um, in discussing that emotional toll, including compassion fatigue. We have another question, another resource um, there it's about understanding educator resilience as well that we welcome you to download for support. And know that you can always reach out to the Red CA Center if you need more information on that topic as well. Thank you so much to everyone for the questions that you have submitted. As a reminder, if you have questions that were not answered or you'd like to continue this conversation, we will be sharing a link to our community of practice chat that we'll, we will be hosting in just under 10 minutes where we will try to answer as many questions as possible. We would like to extend a big thank you to Dr. Barnes. You have brought such a wealth of information and discussion points to this important topic. We do have a few resources that we would like to showcase that might be used by teachers as well as school safety leaders, planning team members, community partners, and other individuals who have an interest or role in emergency management planning. And to kick off our resources section, I am going to turn things back to Dr. Barnes to walk through a few that she has to share today. Thank you. Okay, so the first resource that I included here for you are, I had mentioned earlier that I have a, a, a bunch, maybe I didn't say a bunch, but I do have a bunch of those short courses that are online. So many that it was difficult for me to pack them onto one slide. Please don't be intimidated by this. It took me two years to do all of these courses and get them all online, but man, have they been a lifesaver ever since. Um, but just to take a look at some of the areas in which um, I've created some of the trainings where we have found our needs needing to be addressed. I actually have them broken into different types of categories. Initially, I was 
pitching the courses as I was writing the script to teachers and administrators. And then when I went back and looked in our, um, our learning management system about who was actually taking the courses, I, I realized that a lot of the classes that, were, that we had, the, the online videos that we had, that were sculpted for the teacher role were actually being taken by the classroom aides. So it kind of caused me to reframe what I was doing with the training and really kind of broaden my own perspective about, yeah, it's not about, you know, what the, what the credential is in the classroom. It's about supporting the adult in the classroom, whether they are a certificated staff member or whether they are a paraprofessional. So I just kind of rebrought that had me broaden my thinking so that I had a batch of courses that were really geared towards here's what you do in the classroom. And then instead of here's what you do for administrators, it was really more here's what you do when you're supporting the whole school, which could also be people like the plant manager or the, your food services manager and some of those other critical roles as well. So those are just some examples of some things that uh, we have found very, very helpful. And that fire, earthquake, lockdown, shelter in place, those are among our most popular course offerings. Next slide, please. So the number one popular thing that I have ever produced in my work here in emergency management is this classroom quick guide. It is a, it's a you know, double-sided one-pager. I make it on cardstock and it's laminated and we make enough for every single classroom in the district. When We don't revise it every year, but when we revise it, um, we make 40,000 copies and we ship them to the schools in amounts that are adequate enough to put one in every single classroom and office and, and other areas on the campus as well. And they are incredibly popular. It's just kind of, I know you can't really see it very well on the screen, but you will get a link to the, to the document itself. It's just like that quick little hit of what do I need to do? What are, my, what are the, my key points for addressing this kind of emergency? All that's on the front side and then the back side of that page is the resources section. And then next slide, please. The other resource that I provided for you today is I had mentioned earlier that we have a full complement of emergency teams during a disaster that we leverage. And so I just wanted to give you a, a look at what that looks like. And we do use incident command system. Some of you may be familiar that that is the management system that is used nationwide to manage emergencies. It is required in the emergency response and first responder world to, to use it to manage emergencies. It's not necessarily required by a school or by a school district, but I tell you what, if you're using ICS on your campus and when you can use the same language as the fire captain or the police lieutenant who's rolling up to help you with an incident at your school site, it puts you much further ahead um, because you're, you're literally using the same wording and the same structure for emergencies that they are. So it makes it a lot easier to integrate and operate from unified command. So this is just what we have. We field teams um, in all of these areas from school staff. So yes, we do have our own triage team and a security utilities team. We have, uh, of course, request and reunion gate teams, fire suppression, and that's just using a fire extinguisher. We're not, you know, Nobody's on a hose line. Search and rescue teams, the people that are watching the assembly area and a team for psychological first aid um, to address any socio-emotional needs that have come up immediately as well as the support team. So um, in, in a big disaster, in our district, you won't find a lot of people on the field waiting out there with the kids because they're off taking part. And they are trained to regular kind of civilian sort of levels. I highly recommend CERT training, which is really beneficial and will give people a little bit of uh, knowledge in most of those roles. I think that's all I have. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Dr. Barnes. And for, as Dr. Barnes mentioned, for anyone who is not familiar with ICS, we just also want to point to a fact sheet that the RMCA Center has developed on implementing the National Incident Management System and really looking at practitioner-oriented strategies for education agencies. And we talk a bit about ICS within that fact sheet. So we welcome you to download that as well from the web link. Just as a reminder, there are um, a lot of resources that we have shared that really focus on the role of teacher teachers via the web link. Not only can you download them here, but you will also be able to access them via a resource list that we will 
share along with the archive of this webinar. And we will be sharing a copy of the presentation as a part of that webinar archive as well. You will be able to find that on the webinars page of the REMCA Center website within a week following today's event. Also, know that the REMCA Center is always a resource. We are only an email or phone call away. Please reach out to us if you have any technical assistance requests on any aspect of school emergency management planning. And thank you so much for attending today's webinar, submitting your questions, and engaging with us throughout the event. We truly appreciate your participation, and we hope to see you again at another webinar in our series or to hear from you in the future. We will now be heading over to our community of practice to answer any additional questions that you may have. Thank you so much.